Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Betting Life Podcast brought to you by Fantasy Life, powered by our friends at Unabated. I'm Matthew Freeman, Matt F. The Oracle, and here with me, filling in for Peter Jennings, is professional sports better and co-founder of Unabated, Rufus Peabody. Rufus, we're over halfway through the season. How's it going for you? You know, it's not been a great football season for me. I'm not doing a lot with NFL betting this year. I'm just not like originating sides or, or totals at this point. Um, I still have my power ratings, but uh, it's it's a pretty efficient market, and I think there's there's other opportunities that are better worth exploiting. But uh, the college football has not been great for me. I'll, I'll, I'll be completely honest. So I'm hoping the, the the second half of the season's a little better. You know, I feel that this is. Uh, kind of a common refrain this year for a lot of sharper sports betters that it just it hasn't been that great of a year for a lot of people in the market it's just you know kind of one of those things but uh you know i think we'll we'll get into it a little bit uh all right so this week we're looking at thursday night football we'll discuss a number of miscellaneous topics including the massey peabody power ratings teasers maybe some futures uh the purpose of sports betting that's a big topic uh and then maybe even one bet uh that we think we might be making it for week 11. Uh, Rufus, random question here. Do you say miscellaneous or miscellaneous if you ever use that word? Miscellaneous. Miscellaneous. I, right. I think that's this the way it's supposed to be. Miscellaneous. I, I don't no know. I, I, I've heard I've heard people say that. Misc, like with the, the C, miscellaneous. You know, some people oh, say it that way. Okay. You know, it's well, it's spelled with the C, so people pronounce it. I don't, like, like disc, you know, like if you, you know. So anyway. All right. Thursday night football. Uh, let's see. We have Ravens hosting the Bengals here. And this line is around four favoring the Ravens. 46 is the over under. Is there anything that stands out to you with this game? Yeah, I mean, to me, that number doesn't seem like what I would expect right now. I think that the, the Bengals are getting, uh, I think, a pretty big boost due to the perception that they're a lot better than they were early in the season and that Burrow was play, was not himself. And, and so that that... You know, they, I mean, cause like they, their numbers this season definitely don't support, um, a, a line of minus four. I mean, the Ravens have, are, are the top team in the Massey Peabody rankings, just based on our numbers alone, the power ratings, we make this line, uh, Baltimore minus eight and a half. So, um, I think there's value there at the four, but again, like we're not accounting for the fact that Joe Burrow was potential was, was playing hurt early in the season. And, and the fact that presumably he's healthy now. Right. So I, I lean on the other side of this and a lot of it is basically just throwing out basically all of what we saw from the offense. Uh, Not exactly before the bye week, but a lot of it before the bye week, you know, before Joe Burrow was totally taken off of the injury report, the defense for the Bengals, I don't think is quite where it was last year. Uh, But, you know, a divisional game, these AFC North matchups always tend to be played a little bit tight. Um, but I have this projected at 2.75. And a lot of that is basically under the premise that the Bengals are pretty much back to where they were last year uh, or they were in the preseason with the power ratings. Inter- uh, and so if that's the premise, I think four is probably a reasonable number. But even then, I have it projected a little bit under three. So I will just imagine I'm on the wrong side of this if you're if you're on the Ravens. But um, yeah, it's it's also just a situation where in contextually, you know what? I would actually like your thoughts on this. Contextually, um, this feels like a Ravens not I wouldn't say Ravens fade spot, but Lamar Jackson is a home favorite has always been given too much credit by the market and Joe Burrow as a road dog his you know, just historically outperformed market expectations. And like, those are trends. And like, I know like you wouldn't bet based solely on trends, but I do think that there is underlying data, just performance data um, with those trends. You know, I do think Lamar Jackson as a home favorite, doesn't play up to the market expectations and Joe Burrow as a road dog, uh, you know, with those circumstances does tend to be, uh, I would say like a little more gunslingery. Uh, and I think that probably helps their numbers, but do you have any thoughts on like that dynamic Burrow as a road dog, Lamar Jackson is a home favorite. Um, I, I haven't looked into it specifically, but in general, those types of trends that I found tend to be, I mean, they, they can exist in the numbers. Like they actually like, Burrow has very likely, as you said, has been very good in those spots, but that doesn't mean it's going to necessarily continue. 
And so that I would sort of tend to be a little bit dubious of that unless, unless there's a good, um, I think narrative there where that I think, um, would be backed up by numbers where other, other teams or other players, um, in similar situations have actually had things like that persist. And so to me, what's the difference between being a small favorite or a small underdog, um, on these trends? I don't know. Is yeah. it, you said maybe it's a mindset thing, but at the same time, like, do you think the Bengals are coming in thinking they're huge underdogs? I don't know. I mean, most teams are thinking that, I mean, especially a team like the Bengals, I mean, I think they expect to win the game probably. And so uh, I don't think it's a the, the kind of mindset that the, you know, maybe the Arizona Cardinals are going to have um, like when they played the Cowboys earlier this year. Yeah. But, that's yeah. Also going back to the whole, the, the Bengals. So I had the Bengals is the number three ranked team going into the season, uh, according to the Massey Peabody ratings. And we had them as the number one defense going into the year. And it really is their defense that that's been, um, that's been bad. Their offense is four tenths of a point worse right now than how we had them rated going into the season, but their defense has fallen from a plus 1.9 all the way to a minus 0 0.1. And they, they've, they've been pretty bad across the board. Um, 1.8 standard deviations worse than average against the run, 0 0.7 against the pass. And they've been really, really bad in terms of play success, 1.4 standard deviations worse. So that's kind of um, they what they what they have been is bailed out by the fact that they've they've been good in terms of scoring efficiency. So they're giving up a lot of they're giving up yards, they're giving up successful plays, but they aren't um, translating as efficiently into points for their opponents. So that's the kind of thing that I would expect to to sort of um, like the scoring efficiency to kind of regress more towards um, what those other other metrics are sort of indicating. All right. So a couple of things here. So one, uh, I know that you, I feel like you used to be super into props. I don't know how into props you are anymore. Of course, when the Super Bowl comes around, I feel like you will probably get back in those prop streets. But uh, for this Thursday night football game, uh, one prop I do like Keaton Mitchell under 36 and a half rushing yards. I have this projected at 29. He had just three carries last week. I'm projecting him for 6.7 carries this week, but that still feels kind of optimistic given that they have a three headed backfield uh, with Lamar Jackson also stealing some carries there. So 36 and a half just feels like a number that's probably inflated because Mitchell has had super efficiency uh to this point of his career but you know even that is something that we couldn't project going forward so taking the under there one thing i would like your thoughts on the unders in primetime games but then also just unders in general uh this has been a fantastically profitable year for unders and um i have some thoughts as to why that is maybe the case but what is your read on why we have seen low scoring and unders just absolutely smash this year? I mean, I think it's it's a few different factors, and um, you wrote a really nice article about that. But one thing that I I mean, I think it's largely quarterback play. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have a lot of young quarterbacks, you have a lot of quarterback injuries, and you've had you had this sort of golden era of of sort of pocket passers, um, like prolific pocket passers that kind of has, has ended, I, I would say like with Tom Brady's retirement, I mean, you had what Brady breeze, Roethlisberger, Philip rivers, um, even Matt it. Ryan at some point. I mean, he tells off, right? but Matt Ryan was good. Not Eli Manning. He doesn't count, but so, so you had, you had all these, uh, you, you had these like, uh, uh, Peyton Manning, et cetera. Um, you had these prolific passers that have all kind of retired and, and offenses have changed and, we had um, Kevin Kelly on Bet the Process a few weeks ago, who's famous for being the coach that never punts. And he he was talking about how our RPOs have uh, also the, the proliferation of RPOs at younger levels has kind of stunted quarterback development in terms of reading defenses and stuff. It's kind of been an indirect effect because if you have these athletic quarterbacks, this is what you can do now for them to be best is RPO type um plays and so you, you work on that skill set and you don't develop the they don't get the experience reading defenses being able to change plays of the line quickly um i mean I don't, do you remember those brady manning games where both teams are playing no huddle back it was colts patriots um, yeah. going so fast and and, and it was just like they're, they're doing it with their brains and they they have this ability to dissect uh the defense and, and get themselves in the right play and so i i think you have a bunch of young quarterbacks that are, they've been, a, you have young quarterbacks, some of which have been very effective earlier in their career because 
not because of the ability to necessarily dissect defenses in the way that a Brady or a Manning could, but because of their athleticism and their ability to make the one read or have an offense designed around their strengths. And so um, I, my opinion is it's a quarterback thing. Yeah, it, it feels like probably the super majority of this has to do with quarterback talent because a lot of the other factors, uh, I would say, uh, defenses playing the too high shell. Uh, I think there are more incompetent play callers in the league than there used to be. Uh, and then I would say kickers have improved over the past decade. They're uh, you know better at converting and they have more power. And so it's maybe just a little bit easier for coaches to say, hey, let's kick the field goal instead of let's go for fourth down. But if you had better quarterback play, I think that would change the formula a little bit. Uh, so I do think that quarterbacks... Um, insufficient quarterback play is probably the main culprit here. I, I want your thoughts on the way of approaching low scoring and the unders. So uh, again, this has been the most profitable year to this point for unders out of the past 20 years. And really, I think it's more like the past 30 years and a lot of sharp betters have been dismissive of this trend. Whereas like, I would say more squarish betters have been like, Oh yeah. Unders like, let's just, let's bang this and see how long it goes. And do you think that there's something about the way that sharps think? And I know like you can't say that like all sharps think the same, but it, do you think there's a way that sharps tend to think that would make them less likely to capitalize on this emerging trend or maybe just an emerging trend in general? I think they're going to be health like, I think they'll be empirically skeptical, empirical skepticism. So skeptical, in, unless they're they have data that kind of that kind of goes in a different direction or sort of shows something to be real at the process level. I think that's the big thing, the process level rather than the outcome. So mm -hmm. it's not just the scores; it's what are what are the metrics underlying these scores. And so I, I would I would think that yes, defense or defenses have, or I should say not defenses, but scoring has been down the last like consistently i think ever since what the last like two and a half years maybe yeah since um, the pandemic since 2020 there's been a steady decline where we've lost uh over that time uh, basically a point a year but i do think this season i mean i think there's been variance variance towards the under as well and so mm -hmm. i wouldn't i i would advocate against kind of chasing that trend i think that sometimes i mean I think in general, the public tends to overreact to these things. Um, I, I, in general, the public does like betting overs more than unders though. So, uh, but, but primetime games, especially that's, that's a, that's an area where the public really generally does like betting overs. And so, I mean, that would maybe be the area where unders I would expect to generally have more value, um, just overall regardless. But I, yeah. the thing is, that's been the I, case, I that's the been market the case this year. Yeah. The market knows scoring has been down. Um, I, I would expect going forward, I wouldn't expect unders to be better than overs. I wouldn't expect overs to be better than unders. I, I kind of, I'm going to, I assume the market is going to be fairly efficient in that regard um, in the absence of compelling evidence otherwise. Okay. I, so my gut instinct is to say that you are right. And like, that's the way that I would be oriented on this at the same time. People have been saying exactly what you said for the past year and, and the unders have, have continued to hit. Um, I just feel like, you know, now, like now, if I jump in on the under train, that's when it'll stop. Um, all right. Can I ask how much of it, like, if you look, how often has the over failed to, to get there by like a point, a half a point, two points versus the, versus the over barely getting there. Right. I mean, how much of it's mean versus median? A lot of it is median. It's, you know, it's barely missing. So that that's the kind of thing that I wouldn't say is super predictive, right? I mean, yeah. the difference between a game that's totaled 42 and a half going 42 and 43 is virtually nothing, yet one of them counts towards that under record and the other doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's fair, you know. Um, all right. I want to get your thoughts on the Massey Peabody power ratings. And, you know, we, we've had conversations about this before, and I think the way that you have described it in the past is sort of like uh, – intelligently contextualizing the production data. Um, but can you actually, instead of me just saying what you've said, why don't you just explain what, what it is that you guys are doing? So we, we take data at the play-by-play -play level and we, at the most granular level we can, 
and we um, can try to contextualize performance. We, we look at how a team, a team does um, and not at the player level, um, just the team le- performance level. And we adjust for strength of opponent. We adjust for home field advantage. We adjust for game situation, i.e., you know, garbage time is not worth the same. Um, but we do it in a way that isn't just like this is garbage time. This isn't garbage time. It's there, there's there's different situations where that have more predictive impact, I guess. So everything is built with the the goal of maximizing the sort of predictive power of the statistics we develop. And so that's I think that's it in a nutshell. We don't use super advanced statistics. We're using uh, a metric for uh, yards per rush, yards per pass, um, and then you know yards per play as a function of those play success and then scoring efficiency, which is how efficient are you at translating yards into points. But I think what we do is contextualize those things very well and weight them by their predictive power. All right. At the top of the ratings that you guys have, Baltimore and San Francisco, both of them are higher than eight points above an average team on a neutral field. And then you have this teardrop after them. Uh, several teams that are in the five to six point range, and then a really large drop beneath those teams. Let's talk a little bit about the Ravens. And we, we talked about them earlier, but the Ravens and the 49ers, I know that the Ravens have been at the top or near the top of the power ratings for, uh, it feels like at least over a month now. Uh, and the 49ers have been up there as well. Um, what is it about the 49ers specifically that you think has propelled them to this height? So they're a pretty balanced team. Um, it's It's been, I mean, they have one of, if not, I think they have one of the league's best offenses. Um, I think we have them rated as the number two offense behind Miami. And that's really been, uh, I mean, their, their yards per play passing has been, uh, you know, contextualized, has been best in the league. Um, their play success has been fantastic. Um, and their defense has been has been solid as well. They're a team that doesn't really seem to have any, any big weaknesses. And... They're also a team that, I mean, Brock Purdy has been very efficient, but, you know, you have Kyle Shanahan calling the plays. You have, a, a, and you have a team that I don't think is is, is susceptible to, um, or a team that I, I wouldn't say is super fragile, like maybe the Kansas City is to a Mahomes injury. Even though Purdy's been good, I feel like they have, um, they are a team and they have these sort of pieces that, that can sort of, you know, fill in. Obviously, last year they lost like, 17 quarterbacks so if that happens you know you're not you know you're not in a good position but i think I, I it feels to me like they are it's more sustainable for them to be where they are now than than the ravens even though the ravens are rated higher mm-hmm. all right after the the ravens the 49ers the bills are the number three team now the bills have been uh in you know a, a tumultuous state for the past six weeks Uh, A lot of that, I think, has to do with defensive injuries uh, that they have suffered. No Tredavious White, no Matt Milano, uh, and that has really impacted them. Uh, I think also the fact that their head coach, Sean McDermott, is kind of, uh, I would say, kind of forced himself to pull double duty by being both the head coach and the defensive coordinator. Uh, I think he's probably spread a little bit too thin. Uh, and then they just fired their offensive coordinator, Ken Dorsey, who I don't think was doing a bad job. Like he probably could have been doing a better job, but this offense, I don't think has really been the problem with the team. They turned the ball over quite a bit, but that feels like it has more to do with randomness and with Josh Allen than with Ken Dorsey. But what are your thoughts on the bills here? Uh, I mean, obviously it looks like you guys are still pretty high on them, having them number three overall. Very, and, and it, that's almost all the offense. We, we, I mean, we think their defense is still, we still have their defense rated as an above average unit. And I think a lot of that is, some of that is still prior. Like they, they've dropped a half a point off of where they were going into the season, but their offense has improved actually. It's over overperformed where we had them in week one. We had them at week one as three and a half points better than an average team. Now we have them as 5.5 points better. And so, as you said, yes, it's been it's been turnovers and, and things like that. But on in terms of, um, they're, 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 they're very efficient at moving the ball or in terms of play success, which I mean, that's, they haven't been as explosive as they have in the past, but, but they've been very efficient and that's kind of what we think drives performance more consistently moving forward. I want to ask about the Cowboys and the Dolphins who feel a little bit like versions of each other. 
uh, the Cowboys in the NFC have been dominant as uh, as favorites. I think six and one against the spread as favorites. Uh, and then, you know, something like... Uh, I mean, they haven't Owen, been a dog often. <laughs> right. But like in the games where they have uh, against the Eagles, against the 49ers, lost both of those games, uh, lost against the spread in both of those games. And a similar situation with the, um, with the Dolphins who have absolutely steamrolled teams that, you know, they've outclassed. And then as underdogs, they've underperformed expectations. So it feels like, I won't say like paper tigers, but, you know, teams that are kind of bullies when they have the edge and then can't really stack up whenever they don't have the edge. What are your thoughts on those two teams? So I can see that from a perspective of the Cowboys because they are a sort of a physical team, and I don't think Mike McCarthy is a genius or anything like that. I think that that they're gonna they're gonna do their thing, and if a team is better, then they'll get beat. But you you wouldn't expect that from McDaniel as much, just because I feel like a, a schematic genius should be able to um, put his team in in a good position, even if they're sort of undermanned, like due to his creativity. So I, I think yes, that 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 has been the narrative. I haven't. I don't, I don't know if it means anything moving forward. I wouldn't, I mean, we were, we're not, we're not experts in sort of the whole matchup part of a football, at least from the SCP body where we're like, this is how good you are. This is how good your opponent is. This is what we right. expect. And obviously there's a lot we're missing there. Um, but it is when we have attempted to look at matchup factors, just sort of higher level, I should say, like how good, you know, how do you do against bad teams versus good teams? versus you know what is there an interaction of rushing offense against rushing defense and you know there's not there's not a lot there predictively however i do think if if that at least that we have found in the way we've looked at it i think that just means we haven't looked in the right way but um i i don't know i mean what do you think could be would be causing it for a team like miami I think with Miami, part of it is that, and it's almost kind of the inverse of what you said with the Cowboys, the Dolphins, they feel like, and you know, maybe I'm wrong on this, but they feel like a little bit more of a finesse team. And uh, I think a finesse team can probably outmaneuver teams that aren't as good and aren't as smart, but the teams that have beat the Dolphins feel like the teams that are just physically more imposing. And maybe that is something that changes. Um, but, you know, with the the offensive system for the Dolphins, so much is predicated on timing. And if your offense is going against a defense that is just more physical, I think that disrupts the timing of the play design. Uh, and then in that case, it's just harder to operate. So, I, you know, with the Cowboys, with the Dolphins, I feel like they could probably improve as the season progresses. And, you know, what we've seen out of them when they've been going against inferior opponents has been really impressive. Uh, but of course, you know, like in the playoffs, you're not going to be playing inferior opponents if you get past the first round. So, you know, curious to see how they do. Um, a couple more teams I want to get your thoughts on looking at the Massey Peabody power ratings here. Tampa Bay. Um, you guys have been high on them, you know, relatively compared to the market oh, yeah. high on them throughout the season and the Falcons, you guys have been low on them consistently for most of the season. What are your thoughts with those two teams? And what is it that you're seeing that puts you in those directions? Wait, first off real quick on the, on the topic of the dolphins. My first thought was like one of these sort of big 12, like Mike Leach type offenses. I mean, obviously he wasn't big 12. And he, you know, he was big 12, like 15 years ago, but one of these teams that, um, that put up a, a gazillion yards and points, and then you go in and you play Alabama and suddenly you're not getting anything. Right. Yeah. So it's, um, it's just a whole, a whole different class in terms of, of, of physicality. And so, uh, but back to the bucks, um, the bucks, we actually have them is an above average team going into the season, which is a little bit surprising. We thought their defense is very, was strong, a, a whole point better in, um, than average. And we thought their offense, we didn't expect their offense to be that bad. Uh, only about uh, three tenths of a point worse than, than average going into the season. Part of that is we still, we didn't think Baker Mayfield was that bad a quarterback. And I think he's kind of, um, I think he has, um, he's proven that out a little bit. I mean, he, he may get a, we'll, we'll see what kind of deal he gets in the off season. He, he hasn't played poorly. Um, and Tampa has been, um, a decent team on offense. They haven't been great, but actually 
well, they're 1.9 points worse than a league average team on offense, but their defense has been even better than we thought. And so, you know, just cause you don't have Tom Brady doesn't mean your, your whole defense is going to drop off. Um, and so I think that it, it's basically been mostly due to priors. We had them 0.8. We had them basically ranked 13th in the NFL going into the season. Now we still, we have them as a slightly below average team, um, six tenths of a point worse than average. And Atlanta, I think the real reason we were low on them going into the season was, was the quarterback situation and the fact that they weren't very good last year. So, um, their defense was, was very bad last year too. And we expected their defense to continue to be bad, but, uh, the quarterback situation with Desmond Ritter, um, we were not overly impressed with him coming in. And I think he's shown that he's not been very impressive. I mean, I think Heineke is better for them right now in the short run, although he's, he's hurt and we'll, we'll see what happens there. But I think that the, I, I frankly didn't understand all the hype on the, with the Falcons and, you know, they just, the, their rushing offense was, you know, their hyped rushing offense is, is been, you know, I'd give them, give them like a B minus so far this season. They're, they're slightly better than average, but not a lot. So the Massey Peabody power ratings, a lot of it is predicated on team production, but there is a layer that can be put on top of it that has to do with quarterbacks. Yes. And with the Browns, we have this situation where Deshaun Watson uh, just today was placed on season ending IR because of a, a shoulder injury. He will have shoulder surgery out for the season. Uh, you have PJ Walker there. You have Dorian Thompson Robinson there who looks like he's going to be the starter for this upcoming game, but it wouldn't be surprising if we saw some shuttling back and forth between those two. Um, what do you see as the difference between Deshaun Watson and Dorian Thompson Robinson uh, or, or PJ Walker for that matter? I mean, I know that Watson hasn't played great this year, but I still think there's a pretty significant difference between him and those other two guys. I think so. And ju just because he hasn't played great doesn't mean we don't expect him to play better. Right. I mean, he's, he's been pretty abysmal except after he broke his shoulder and then magically became a good football player again last week. But he, um, it, it, it's the Browns are an interesting team though, because they've basically done well despite quarterback play. And that's kind of hard to, that, that, that's hard to, um, consistently do. That's not super repeatable. Um, their defense has been, amazing it's been the best defense in football um oh actually we have kansas city's rated slightly higher um i stand corrected but i i definitely show it as a as a substantial downgrade at this point despite the fact that deshaun has not been good and i, I think a lot of that like we're going to be we're going to be low on quarterbacks that don't have a ton of experience and are not high draft picks generally because like historically they don't come in and set the world on fire like this is based on what that drop off typically looks like. And so that's kind of, that's where we're at. Like we still rated Deshaun Watson as a slightly better than average quarterback in terms of what we'd expect him from him moving forward. Um, I, I actually ran the ratings with PJ Walker and, and we, we have Walker as about a, um, about a three point downgrade there. Okay. Interesting. I, I have with, uh, Deshaun Watson to Dorian Thompson Robinson as a 4.2 point downgrade. Does that feel like it's in the right vicinity? It, it does, but I feel like this is one of these situations where it, it, it feels like my downgrade is, is too high, just given the way Cleveland plays. It's not super mm -hmm. predicated on quarterbacks. They play, they're, they're, they're playing slower. Um, it's these sort of defensive games where, where they're, they're not asking their offense to do a lot. So yeah. In a way, if they had a bad offense and we're playing a, we're playing like I don't know, or sorry, if they had a bad defense and we're, I don't know, let's say a team like Miami, like yes, it's going to have a much bigger impact. Yeah, at, at least that's not my number saying that, but that's kind of that's my intuition. All right, let's talk about teasers at Unabated. You guys have the teaser tool, which allows people to go there to uh, kind of play around with the odds and to see where they have various edges. And, uh, you know, based on the research a long time ago by Stanford Wong, three and seven are the key numbers. It feels like those are kind of the only numbers that matter for six point teasers versus like say seven and 10, where you don't get the same value as if you're going through three and seven. Um, but I would kind of like to get your thoughts on teasers in general. Uh, what, like, do you do teasers? Do you think there's a, an optimal way to do them? Is it basically only three and seven with uh, games that have low totals? Give us kind of the teaser perspective. 
so all, all teasers are are parlays of alternate lines and, and sports books for a while um figured out that if you know if you give you give a better six extra points like you know that's worth a certain amount like and it's pretty consistent no matter where you are on that distribution except that one point as you mentioned if you're able to tease across the three and seven meaning if you have a seven and a half point favorite you get six points you're 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 laying one and a half instead and so um th that those still are um they're profitable depending on the odds you're getting from your book right now most books for six point teasers or are, are, i mean you're having to lay minus 120 on a two leg um 16 teaser or six point teaser i should say and i actually tend to look more towards the sort of three leg teasers and occasionally four leg teasers um because where you can get a slightly lower implied um break even win probability and so what's amazing is you can kind of explore this with with the unabated teaser tool um for nfl and for other sports uh, although i feel like the nfl is the one where there is the most well documented um opportunities so i mean this week i actually like teasing the bills for minus seven and minus one i'm not going fully across the seven i'm only getting half of that but that's still um if i have a six point three leg teaser and I tease minus seven to minus one, that portion of the teaser um, has a 1.9% edge. And so I, I would, I, I th there's a, there's not a ton of games this week that sort of fit the criteria, but um, there are, there are four or five. And so uh, like there's Buffalo, Minnesota from two and a half to eight and a half Philly from plus three, if you can get them plus three to plus nine. And normally again, you teasing plus three to plus nine blindly isn't good, but this is a situation where um, I have DraftKings up on, on my sort of unabated teaser page here. And DraftKings has the line at the Eagles plus three minus 118. And so that that is, um, you, you're obviously not having, like the fact that it's it's juiced towards the underdog there um, is not, that doesn't, um, that juice doesn't translate to the teaser, which is nice. So I'm guessing because we show an edge there, I'm guessing that's probably because that line's more like a true two and a half. But, and so the innovator teaser tool uses that, the fact that like, okay, you're getting a slightly off market price here. That's actually worth something and that, that, that helps you find, find an edge. And so, um, there, there's a few, there's a few teaser par, not parlay, sorry, but a few, uh, three leg teasers that I'm, that I'm targeting for this week, but Matt, I'm going to wait. I'm not going to bet these immediately. Um, just because whenever you're, when, whenever you're, um, laying a price and i know even if i'm if i'm betting a 6.3 leg teaser at plus 160 i'm still laying a price on each of the individual legs if you're laying a price uncertainty is not your friend so if you know the bills go from minus seven to minus seven and a half that um and i i tease them to minus one like you know that doesn't help me as much as it would hurt me if the bills moved from minus seven to minus six and a half so basically variant, you know, uncertainty is not your friend there. And, and so I, I'm, I tend to wait until later in the week, um, just so uh, it, it's the opposite of normal. Normally you want to bet early because lines are less efficient, but, um, this whole thing is predicated on the lines being efficient. You know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And you mentioned the team that I was actually thinking about. And so two things. So one, yeah, the benefit that you get from teasers is not so much that you are on the the quote-unquote right side although it helps if you're on the right side but that you are getting a structural benefit by um some sort of mispricing based on what the books are doing and the odds that they are giving you and so in that scenario uh you do want to be uh in a fairly efficient market you do want to have certainty because then you know that uh chaos or there's at least a reduced chance of chaos uh upending your position but with the bills specifically um the fact that this number is at seven and so the way that i have been thinking about the bills this week is that i would like to wait i have this projected above seven i think i have this projected around like 7.75 so waiting at the seven if this moves to the six and a half then i would really like to bet it there if it stays at seven, maybe I bet it on Sunday. And if it moves, it. if it moves to seven and a half, 
then I would tease it or just lay off of it. Uh, what are your thoughts with that? I would say you're still better off teasing it from minus seven to minus one. Again, depending on what odds you're getting on the teaser, okay. but yeah, but I think that 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 is just a better execution of the same bet, right? Or, or if you like yeah. the bill side, that there's better value doing that. Got it. Yeah. So I, I will say that with Buffalo, I mean, that's that's one where I like the Buffalo side as well. And so that's one I might be tempted to lock in earlier just because I do think if the if I think the line is going to move that direction, then just like in general, you know, sure you want to get get a price now. But sure. But the thing is going from again, if the if the the line goes from Buffalo minus seven to minus seven and a half, my teaser is going from minus one to minus one and a half, which isn't nearly as big a move as the minus seven to minus seven and a half is. So yeah yeah you're, it's so so i guess hitting it early is not as important there yeah all right uh futures anything stand out to you in the futures market yeah actually i kicked off some sims just uh before we hopped on the show using the massy peabody numbers and i'll say um i i like the ravens super bowl uh super bowl numbers you can get let's see anywhere from plus 850 to plus a thousand uh, on them to win the Super Bowl, and based on the Sims I just kicked off, we have the number right around um, Ravens plus five hundred one. And I was manipulating the injury numbers a little bit and the the downgrade for if Lamar gets hurt and those probabilities. But I mean, I think do I think that the Bills or do I think the Ravens are really five to one to win it? Probably not. Um, Massive everybody's a little high on them. And I wonder what, what I'm probably going to do before I'd bet it is I would also run a, a set of simulations using market-based ratings and see what that shows. If there's value in both, then I'd feel comfortable firing there. I but, like that. I like that. But it does right. feel to me, this is like my dumb, non quantitative brain, like, like the Ravens kind of don't have that much higher that they could rise. In essence, it's like, I feel like it's more likely that their rating drops than it falls. Whereas if you had a team like, you know, like a team like Kansas City up there, or even San Francisco, I feel like, you know, maybe just as likely to rise as fall. Why do you think that's the case? I don't know. It's just if it, it, because a lot of it's. I mean, their defense has been has been very good, and Lamar. I mean, they're fragile to a Lamar Jackson injury, clearly. Um, but I just, given how how they played in previous years it and with you know not that different personnel on the offensive side i mean yes they have better skill position players now well actually they, they got pretty lit up on in with injuries the last few years um but i don't know like this is the, right this is this is my my square brain saying this all right it's it is interesting um they have a matchup on christmas day monday christmas day week 16 on the road against the 49ers. I feel like that game could tell us a lot about this team because that really is the one premium team. Uh, and then I guess the Dolphins the week after that. But the 49ers, that really is the only top tier team that they are playing for the rest of the season. So I feel like that will be a, a pretty significant game just in terms of the evaluation of this team. And you know, hopefully both of those teams are healthy for that game. Uh, I want to ask you a question, kind of bigger picture question uh, about, I, I'm putting this under sort of the rubric of like the purpose of sports betting. There was a discussion on social media earlier this season, and I think it was started by Spanky, uh, who said something like, the best sports better is the one who wins the most money. And I think this touches on the questions of just like, what is the purpose of sports betting? And like, what was the purpose of of making money? But like, how would you... I guess there are going to be a couple of questions here, but sort of big picture, how would you determine criteria? If if someone came to you and said, Rufus, help us determine who the best sports better is in the world. How would you go about the task of trying to determine who that person is? I don't know. That's a tough question. Like, it's like if you asked who's the best investor, is it right. the one who makes the most money? Is it the one who has the highest ROI? Um, is it the one who does the the best in sort of highly liquid markets i don't know the answer there i think i think it i disagree that it's the person who wins the most money because i mean people different people got into sports betting for different reasons and you know for me it was 
believe it or not, it wasn't about the money. It was about the intellectual challenge of it. And I'm a competitive person and I like, I like winning. And, and so in sports betting was a great outlet for that. And I had this scoreboard. And so for me, if I would rather make less money, but do it in a way that I enjoyed it. Um, but maybe that makes me not as good of a sports better. I don't know. I, I, but I, again, I don't think it's just because you're, you're someone is wagering more money makes them necessarily a better, better. So right. if, I mean, I don't know how I define it. I mean, you could say, okay, market impact, which is going to be a function of, um, a function of your sort of market influence and in, in your bet sizing and ability to scale things. Um, like Spanky, I mean, Spanky comes from, uh, approaches things from a different perspective. He's, he's coined the term top down better. Spanky's very good at, at kind of coining these words. They, they get, you know, like top down, yeah, betting partner, top down better rather than like agent and steam chaser. Right. Um, but, uh, like the way he does things works for him, but it's not a way that, I mean, to me, that's not the same sort of challenge. Sorry, I'm not really answering your question here. No, it, it's a tough, it's a tough question. It's not exactly like what is the meaning of life, but like it's it's kind of akin to it because like it it does touch on the idea of like what is the what is the purpose of money? Like what is the way in which you want to spend your time? And so like let's say one sports better makes eight hundred thousand a year while spending eighty hours a week on it, and another makes two hundred thousand a year while spending twenty hours a week on it. Like who's better? You know, like. I mean, I don't know the the person who maybe does it with a quarter of a time and probably still has enough money to live like that actually sounds pretty good, you know, so that person is not making the most money, but they're maybe living a happier life. And it, you, you touched on this earlier for you. It was the intellectual exercise, like the, the challenge of approaching a betting market and thinking about how to beat it that really uh that really kind of sparked your interest in it and i think like for me it's a it's a similar type of thing you know like i enjoy more the idea of kind of breaking this down and thinking about it a little bit like not exactly like an an lsat puzzle or something like that but there is an an intellectual component and you know, more so than an entertainment component, although for some betters that also is part of it, but an intellectual component more than a money making component that I really enjoy with the betting market. Um, and of course, like I'm I'm nowhere near like the better that Spanky is, all right? But I don't know if I actually want to be either. Like I don't know if I would actually enjoy spending my time the way that Spanky spends his time. And I think that actually is kind of an important thing for people to think about. And Spanky's nowhere near the handicapper you are. No, I, don't, I, I would, I would probably disagree with it. Spanky's not a handicapper though. That's yeah. the whole point. Yeah. So I think it's about what you're, I mean, you get to choose your own identity, what you value and yeah. how you spend your time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Week 11 bets. I want to kind of close out with this. Uh, you talked about the Thursday night football game. Uh, you do like the Ravens at minus four. Uh, looking ahead, and you also talked about the Bills uh, interested in teasing them. Is there anything else that stands out to you? Not to say that you've definitely bet it at this point, but it's a line that catches your eye that you might be on it as well. I'd say the Bears plus nine with Justin Fields slated to return. I mean, I, I, I cert I, I knocked them a good amount with 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 Tyson Bajent. Am I saying his name right? Yes, the Bajent um, of chaos. Right. I mean, part of it is like, and in, in the, they if they overperformed with him, some of that is going to be based on him being better than I expected. But also, some of that's the fact that the team is the the team around him as well. And so it's almost like now we sub in this quarterback who we expect to be this much better. And so we let's see if that that transfers over. And so, I mean, I I show a pretty big discrepancy here. Um, I make the line about five and a half. Um, but I'm also a little bit low on the lions. So I think that that's part of it. I have the difference between Justin Fields and Tyson Bajent as around three points. Does that feel accurate to you or does that seem a little bit low? Let's see. I'm pulling up my number. Let's see what we had last week. I kind of actually thought fields might return last week, but um, I did too. So I, um, I have it at 3.8 points. Mm -hmm. 
yeah this this is a number that is interesting to me and it did touch 10 earlier in the week and you know that would have been a, a great time to get it but it does feel like uh this could continue to move towards the bears as we get closer to kickoff i i don't see this going back the opposite direction yeah i mean it's a divisional game um it's yeah i mean i i kind of agree with you there all right one line that stands out to me uh the steelers and this line has just continued to move towards the steelers it you know earlier in the day was plus two plus two and a half now it's plus one in a lot of places it would not surprise me if this actually just ended up flipping at some point to the steelers being favored with dorian thompson robinson slated to start for the browns but you know the steelers have been one of the league's unluckiest team or sorry uh luckiest, luckiest teams yeah luckiest teams uh just in terms of i mean you look at their their point differential uh you know the the turnovers they get when they get them uh everything like that but it's a divisional game uh you know afc north which means i think it's going to be a tighter kind of contest and uh you know the browns with deshaun watson i had them power rated as the better team now i don't think that's the case uh you know and then this is just a situational spot where historically mike tomlin with his voodoo magic has done well and kevin stefanski uh has done poorly in division he's done poorly as a favorite and as a divisional favorite he's two and eight against the spread this is just kind of like the exact time in which uh stefanski tends to turtle up and not uh not do what he should be doing on offense so very much on the the steelers in the spot and you know again i I imagine that this number kind of moves in only one direction and I don't, I don't think it has met resistance yet. So again, wouldn't be surprised if this ended up with Steelers being favored. Uh, any thoughts on this game, Rufus? You know, I make, I make Cleveland a slight favorite about uh, a favorite of 0 0.7 points again, just because of the injury there. But it is interesting that, that Pittsburgh is the team that has been like extremely, extremely fortunate. Um, they're what six, no, and one, uh, in one score games this year yet yeah. um, yet they're being a little bit um, undervalued here yeah I mean it's yeah the, and the Steelers they also feel like a team that could continue to actually improve as the season progresses like I don't see how their offense really could be much worse um, but they have a good defense maybe Kenny Pickett in his second year the second half of the season maybe he improves a little bit and so the team actually maybe kind of grows into the record that they have well so what's interesting is their defense actually hasn't been that good in terms of uh on a per play basis i mean they're uh, almost a full standard deviation worse than average against the run and 0 0.69 standard deviations worse against the pass but they have been the number one team in football in terms of defensive or number two team sorry in terms of defensive scoring efficiency which is basically like they're getting the stops in the red zone their their teams are missing field goals against them i don't know if that's the case but you know what i mean they're they're their yeah. their points allowed doesn't really match what they're giving up per play so uh, i i mean if they can keep doing that then you know more power to them but that that's kind of pretty hard to sustain given the per play metrics yep all right, Rufus, this was awesome having you on the show. I believe that at Unabated, you guys are doing a seminar on sports betting. Maybe I'm I'm wrong on that or like the the exact timing of it. But I think that is that coming later today. I'm not sure the timing of that, actually. OK, uh, I guess I should put that in the outline. So I, I could have asked a better question. You could have given a better answer. But I, I do believe that is later this afternoon. Um, and do you think that will be available for people to watch afterwards or do you have to be there as it's happening? So this is not my department, so I can't, I, I can't, I can't tell you that. Unfortunately, um, I, do <laughs> I not asked know the a bad question. question. So I asked a bad follow-up question. No. All right. What do you guys like have? Jack would know. <laughs> what do you guys have going on at Unabated that people should check out? We have a lot. I mean, we have, we have an odd screen with, um, amazing tools to help you find, um, positive expected value bets. And we have the, the whole edge rusher, which essentially is going to find all these different bets based on, um, based on market inefficiencies. So der like derivative type bets, um, we have the NFL season simulator, which I sort of demoed by running power ratings, um, and, and finding futures value today. So we basically have a lot of tools that can help you get the most out of your betting ability.
All right. Awesome. Rufus, thanks for joining us again. That is going to do it for this week 10 episode, week 11 episode. Time is flying. Week 11 episode of the Betting Life podcast powered by Unabated. Please subscribe to the show. Tell your degenerate betting friends. Join the Discord. See all of our bets in the free Fantasy Life Bet Tracker. And follow us on social media at Rufus Peabody and Matt F. The Oracle. Thank you and see you again next episode.